Good morning and thank you very much for coming here today. Um, and this is going to be the tribute to David that never happened because, as most of you will know, he died very early on in the pandemic in the first very strict lockdown. And um, so I want to make up for the fact that he never really had a proper tribute service. And I'm hoping this will, to some degree, make amends for that. And it is more like a worship service. And so I'm going to start with some opening words. And we will be singing some hymns and listening and watching about the life and works of David Dawson. And these words, which I've ad adapted um, from We Come With Hope by Celia Midgley. Welcome to a day of celebration, a day of gratitude and hope. We bring our offering of thanks for the insight and dedication of those who sought to strengthen religious freedom with ties of love and helpfulness, with resolve to build ever firmer bonds of support, let us celebrate with joy and singing. And so we'll sing our first hymn, Name Unnamed. I was very fortunate in preparing this workshop in having access to a few short articles that David himself had written. Listening to his own words reveals far more about him than I could ever hope to achieve by simply giving a summary of his life. And I'm deeply indebted to his widow, Christine, for lending me these, as well as a number of photographs which I will be sharing with you. To begin with, here is a short email which David wrote to a friend in December 2011 
which I believe says quite a lot about him and his character. And this is what David wrote. Hello, Paul. I feel I owe you a response. Thanks, and no thanks, really, for wanting me to be added to your professional network LinkedIn. There is nothing personal about it, but I have set my technological face against Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. I find I have enough information, often too much, from so many sources. I still need time to do what are, for me, the essentials of life. Music, walking, gardening, reading, writing, publishing, and still some professional work. I will, of course, always be happy to receive an email from you. Attached is our Christmas letter for 2011, and you might find some bits of it interesting. We've done an annual letter since 1982, so we have built up a family history. We might even do this annual letter more for ourselves than for our friends. Happy Christmas and a peaceful New Year, David. <laughs> now what this tells me about David is that actually he was quite a private man. He had many public roles, as we know, which naturally put him in the spotlight or on the podium, whether as a solo performer, a lay preacher, a music examiner, or conference organiser. But he didn't want to give everything about himself away or express his views and feelings too openly or publicly. He had a natural reserve and, as they say, kept his own counsel. However, in 2002, he was approached by the editor of the Unitarian magazine to write about himself under their occasional title, Profile. And I'm going to read this now, occasionally filling out some of the details as I understand them, but allowing him to speak for himself in his own words. Born in 1939, I had what many readers will recognise as a fairly standard northern working, up, working class Unitarian upbringing. And this is actually a picture of him and his parents on holiday at Cleveley's. <laughs> My parents were the members of the Unitarian Church at Staleybridge. And that church, and perhaps more importantly its Sunday school, provided the religious and a lot of the social structure to life in the 1940s and early 50s. Sundays were totally taken up with church and Sunday school. During the week and throughout the year, there was a regular pattern of activities that more or less defined my existence. Was this a good beginning for a Unitarian? Certainly, it provided a religious imperative which I have not lost, but I have in later years tried to avoid being part of an all-embracing church or Sunday school regime, feeling that in, it was, in the long run, more restricting than enabling. Student days. I was fortunate with Staley Bridge ministers in my formative years. Charles Bartlett, Keith Treacher, and John Andrew Storey provided quite different ministries, but ones of conviction, energy, and for me, widening horizons. As a member of the Unitarian Young People's League, I started to have contact beyond North East Cheshire. I attended events at Great Hutlow, but I never held any national posts. This was the era of the Reverend Dudley Richards, as Secretary of the Religious Education and Youth Department, and most importantly, his youth leadership courses. It was at a meeting of one such course that I met Christine Radford, a young Unitarian from Birmingham. The rest, as you say, is history. <laughs> Dudley pointed the way. Commitment to your local church as the basis for involvement in the wider movement. Professional life and religious life inevitably intermix when musical skills are present. I started, 
like many seven-year-olds, with piano lessons, and as a teenager had an untutored feel for composition and musical direction. There probably hasn't been a year since my early teens when I haven't written something for Unitarian worship or directed Unitarian music making. What I will just add at this point is that David went to grammar school in Stockport where his horizons were extended by the geography teacher and field studies as well as the music department. He played the viola in the Stockport Youth Orchestra and was invited by friends to play string quartets in Cheshire before cycling home at night. In later years, he realised how much his mother would have worried waiting for his return. His parents always felt that music was a hobby and would never give him a career. <laughs> how wrong they were. After professional training at the Royal Manchester College of Music and Manchester University, I worked in Mid Wales, far from a Unitarian congregation. At this time, membership of the National Unitarian Fellowship and the beginning of 15 consecutive yearly visits to the Family Holiday Conference provided the religious framework for a young family. Picture young family. Alan and Richard. After four years of teaching in Hull, and evidently this was a very tough place where he worked hard to encourage kids to become involved in music. And uh, next picture, please. And this is um, early in his con conducting career, conducting the David Lister High School Band in Hull. Anyway, they had four fairly tough years in Hull. And then we moved to the West Riding, professionally into training teachers. And religiously, into the inspired ministry of Ben Downing at Russell Street, Bradford. And this is David in Bradford. And while he was in Bradford, during the 80s and 90s, he conducted the Bradford Opera Group, which is something which he did um, for 12 years. And here he is with the, this is with the Bingley Orchestra. And then... Yes. And there he is, in a, a production of Il Trovatore, apparently. And so he really um, cut his teeth as a, as a professional conductor with this very good opera group. As a creedless denomination, anything we put into print takes on greater significance. Our hymn books say a lot about us and I was pleased to be associated with Reverence, the Reverend Sidney Knight in the production of both Songs for Living, 1972, and Hymns for Living, 1985. Two books that were needed at the time to reflect the changing and widening focus of Unitarian thought and its expression. I still find Hymns for Living convincing, although I'm not altogether, with some of my, altogether happy with some of my own music, but that is the nature with most creativity. There he is. Now, um, this is when he was um, musical director of the Bradford Opera Group. And now, at th that point, we're going to have a pause for another hymn. <laughs>
I'm going to make a short digression at this point to show some photos of David's interest in various outdoor pursuits. Climbing. Running. And I think this was a marathon. Four out of ten steps. Yeah. yeah. The Bradford Marathon. Walking with the Long Distance Walkers Association and generally taking on other challenges. Anyway, he continued with his profile. Reverend Arthur Valance encouraged me to attend an Oxford conference of the Unitarian Church Music Society in the late 1970s. And in the 80s, I became chairman of, of the Music Society. A more significant contribution has been made to the many conference workshops and the editing, including much writing, of the newsletter Cantemus. And we've got some copies of old editions of Cantemus to, to offer you later. I started with volume 35 of Cantemus in 1985. I missed a couple of editions while I was working abroad, but have just published volume 66. Out of the UCMS, which now incidentally is more usually called just the Unitarian Music Society, came the idea of a national Unitarian choir. <laughs> British Unitarians in Concert. I formed British Unitarians in Concert for a tour to New England in 1992. And further tours have taken place since to Canada in 1995, Hungary and Romania in 1998, Prague also in 1998, and now, at the time he wrote this profile, uh, we are on the threshold of the tour to Germany over Easter 2002. And here, the next picture is, show, shows um, UMS on tour with the bell ringers. <laughs> I should add at this point that during the 1990s, David had a two-year contract with the British Council in Ankara, Turkey, to write and to try out music teacher training courses for, Tur for Turkish universities. This involved travelling to many non-tourist places in the country, walking with a local tour company, playing chamber music with diplomats and work colleagues, and training a choir at the British Embassy for Christmas. After that, and until he was 75, David became a music examiner, examiner for Trinity College London. And this actually, this post took him all over the world. Um, took him and Christine to many foreign countries where they had some fascinating experiences. I became involved in the Foy Society in the 1960s and 70s. And this continues now as treasurer of the trustees of the Green at Flag with an active interest in the future of the barn. Next. And here he is cooking breakfast at the barn. <laughs> My involvement with the Unitarian Centre at Great Hutlow has been virtually lifelong, from a family visit in the late 1940s to present day membership of the management committee. I think I was fortunate in 1995 to be the chairman at a time when the need for a su substantial <coughs> development and available funding coincided. The next two photographs we'll have one um, shows David looking particularly relaxed, I think. The first at the piano with lo what looks like a score of his own in front of him, and the second with his granddaughter Georgina at Ilkley Playground. And this is how David summarized his profile. Doing a self-profile is an interesting exercise and, like musical composition, knowing what to leave out is often more important than what to put in. 
I have never thought of myself as anything other than a Unitarian. I have no problem with that single word description. However, I might just add that when David was president of the GA, he did write an article to the Inquirer that he was bored by the title General Assembly of Unitarian and Free Christian Churches. He sometimes unilaterally described himself as President of Unitarians in Britain, which, while not strictly accurate, he thought was more memorable. And he completed his profile with this statement. If I am forced further, I will describe myself as a spiritual humanist. And I suspect that stance comes from my experience as a musician playing and working with other Unitarians. May it continue. Well, my final photos show David at a music society conference. The first, playing his recorder at Old Chapel in Great Hutlow. And my last photograph, raising his arms in triumph over one of our performances of Trial by Jury in the Peach Room <laughs> of the Nightingale Centre in 2012. We've got one more him to sing in a moment and then I'm going to give some of my own quite briefly recollections of um, how I got to know David but first of all I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to read you um, from Roots and Wings and this is um, what he wrote under the title of Our Common Humanity We want peace We long for peace Obvious or perhaps not. Straightforward? By no means. Different beliefs, varying cultures, contrasting lifestyles, attitudes and values that differ and are all deeply embedded. These have the potential to undermine the search for peace and to do so at all levels from the seemingly trivial local issue to events on the international stage. We live in a very fragile world where disagreement and conflict are often close to the surface and sometimes become an open sore or worse. How can we accept and celebrate profound differences and all the variety and diversity that implies and still live side by side in peace. Look into the eyes of the other person and see not the differences but our common humanity. See a breathing sensitive being that is quite simply a reflection of you. External differences now fade and a shared humanity is revealed. Then peace may begin. And now let's join together and sing the third hymn, A Church is a Living Fellowship.
before I bring this time of remembrance to a close, I would like briefly to talk about my own relationship with David. I met him through the Unitarian Music Society many years ago, and with Adrienne, my partner, shared many happy times with him and Christine, not only at the summer conferences, but also at their home in Ilkley. David struck me as a self-contained man, not given to overdue praise or flattery, enthusiastic, set very high standards both for himself and others, but moderate in his taste and opinions. Uh, and I will just share one little incident which exemplifies this, I think. Um, once at, um, we always have what we call a main work at the summer conferences, uh, which we practice over the August weekend. And one of those um, was Purcell's Dido and Aeneas. And he cast me as Aeneas, <laughs> which was a very proud moment for me because I'd never been in an opera before, let alone being cast as the tenor lead. So I was quite excited about this. And um, so I, um, I was given plenty of time to practice it, which I did at home. But one day I had a phone call from David and he wanted to come over and hear me sing it. Uh, uh, and so he drove over one day from Bradford to York, uh, where I live, and um, he put me through my paces. He sat at the piano and I had to sing the part and I thought it was going quite well. And he said, well, that bit's not quite right. Um, just do that bit again, you see. So I, I sang it again. It seemed OK to me. And it was obviously getting slightly better. And um, anyway, we invited him uh, for lunch and so on. And then in the afternoon, he said, let's go back to the piano, please, if you don't mind. And I worked on it for another two hours. <laughs> now, it's, the part of Aeneas is not that big. It's only got two sections, really. Um, but he, he really worked me quite hard. And at the end of it, by about four o'clock in the afternoon, he said that I was safe. <laughs> I wasn't good. I wasn't even quite good, but I was safe. And with that, he went home. And I think that says quite a lot about David. He was not given to flattery. He set high standards for himself and for others. And actually, when I did hear the recording of it later, you know, I sang it and I thought it went quite well, but the recording. It wasn't that good, really. So I, was, I got the notes, I got the rhythm, but I probably wasn't much better than safe. <laughs> <laughs> but above all, David was open to new ideas, as I discovered um, when I once presented him with, with, with a new idea, and it was a libretto that I had written for a musical, and I, I had called it Oliver's Journey Home. I'll explain a little bit about the story, why I called it Oliver's Journey Home. I, I can't remember too much about the origin of this, but anyway, I wrote this libretto, and I, there were one or two local composers I tried it, uh, tried it out on, they weren't very interested, and so I thought, I wonder whether David might possibly be interested, and I sent it to him, and to my great surprise, he liked the script and agreed to set it to music. He worked very hard on it. He insisted on many changes and additions to my text. We had a ding-dong email exchange for many months about this, and it was all with the aim of performing it at the summer conference two years ago. But by then, the pandemic had set in, which he fell prey to in Airedale Hospital, and he died, and the musical was never performed. And like so many things, at that time, it just bit the dust and, um, and was in danger of sinking without trace. He'd practically done all the work on it. There was a bit of orchestration to do, um, but he produced the score, and he produced it really quite beautifully. He, um, you know, everything was done so professionally, ring-bound and everything, and 
very professional um, and he produced 50 copies of this and we even tried it out at the conference um, the previous year um, to see if people would like it and they did so we were planning to do it but it never happened however this year it is going to be performed in his hometown of Ilkley normally we would just perform it at the Nightingale Centre over the course of the weekend but we decided to go for broke this time and we're going to practice it at Great Hutlow and then we're all going to pile into a coach and um, we're going to perform it at the Clark Foley Centre um, in the, in the centre of Ilkley and um, where we hope to have a, an audience of a hundred people and um, and to give it a good show and um, it will be our way of paying tribute to David who was our loyal and inspiring president for so many years. The story of it, of the show, um, it's supposed to be <laughs> based um, on a sort of odyssey. The idea is that, as you know, Odysseus went off to fight in the Trojan Wars and then he had a long perilous journey full of adventures on the way back. Well, it's a kind of feeble parody of that in a way. Oliver is a young violinist who comes from Bridlington on Sea, where his parents own a fish and chip shop, not exactly Ithaca in the Greek islands, but <laughs> anyway, it's my idea of Ithaca. He's, um, and he, he's a violinist. And he, um, the opening words refer to the Odyssey. You may have heard of Homer, Odysseus and the rest. We can't beat that for telling. It surely is the best. A ten-year trip of troubles, frustrations and delays. This one's hardly epic, but it has reminiscent ways. Let's introduce our hero, Oliver Richard Dunn. A minstrel boy, a singer and composer rolled into one. A Yorkshire lad with mum and dad, a happy family, all living at our favourite place, Bridlington on Sea. And then Mr and Mrs Dunn, they talk about how they bought a chip shop and how successful it was. And then Oliver shows that he, um, he's quite good on his granddad's violin. And he started playing it, and um, his father realised, Ollie, my boy, that's just a toy. We'll buy you something special, and then with proper teaching, we'll turn your gift to a profession. And the chorus then sing, Oliver, go out there, capture every heart. In the festival at Salzburg, the concert's in Stuttgart terrible rhymes but never mind <laughs> never mind it inspired david from the yangtze to the yukon to the mighty mississippi but don't forget old bridlington and your parents fish and chippy <laughs> and now you're going to be given a small rendering of this richard has kindly agreed to do a bit of singing so you're going to get so you're going to get a taster of it Of the 
town I made a blinking packet He never let us down They played lots of tourists And a widespread reputation For quality and freshness Of real speculation Beware of a tourist And a widespread reputation For quality and freshness of talent from my granddad's ancient fiddle and when 18 my dad who was never one to quibble said what a transformative effect good music has on very cheap lyrics. <laughs> anyway, I just want to tell you a little bit more about the story. And um, Oliver goes off to a violin academy in Huddersfield. Um, and he, he's doing quite well, but there's something about a bit stiff and laboured about his playing. Um, and somehow he needs to free up a bit, um, and it slightly troubles him. Now, on the journey home, his odyssey, a strange experience happens, and I'm not going to tell you what it is, because you must come and see the show in Ilkley to find out. But he has this experience, and he d d discovers a new violinist within him, and he... On his cycle home, he happens to stop in York, and where I come from, and outside York Minster, there's very often one of these street pianos, and there's a jazz pianist um, playing it, and um, he listens to the, the jazz pianist, and he gets out his fiddle and starts playing beautifully. And we're just going to play you a little bit of the jazz pianist, how, and um, the, the pianist as well has the effect of getting all the chords tapping and dancing in the streets <coughs> bottom of 47 okay. four bars in
This is a joint production by UK Unitarian TV and the Unitarian Music Society.